And I want to welcome all of you from across the world who are tuning in today to our webinar, An International Perspective on Financial Inclusion, Social Justice, and Credit Union Regulatory Advocacy. In this webinar, Rodney Hood, the chair of the National Credit Union Administration, which regulates credit unions here in the United States, will discuss the efforts on credit unions across the world and the, the ability they have to expand efforts related to diversity, equity, and inclusion, and financial inclusion to promote racial and social justice. And we're also joined by a couple of other panelists today, if we could share their cameras as well. Uh, engaging in a discussion with Chairman Hood about his presentation will be Brian Branch, our own World Council President and CEO, and Jim Nussel, who is the President and CEO of CUNA Credit Union National Association, our member, direct member here in the United States. And they will be discussing not only Chairman Hood's presentation, but also international regulatory advocacy efforts as it relates to the United States and across the world. With that, I want to introduce Chairman Hood. He is the chair again of the National Credit Union Administration, with, which regulates credit unions here in the United States. And Chairman Hood, I will turn things over to you to give your perspective on financial inclusion, social justice. Take it away. Great, well, thank you very much. It's such a pleasure to be here today, at least virtually. And I thank you all for joining us. The World Council of Credit Unions and the Credit Union National Association have both been providing outstanding leadership and representation for the credit union industry during this time of great trial. And we're all grateful for your efforts. With the challenges that have emerged in recent months, it's clear just how critical that leadership truly is. If we consider these various challenges that have arisen in just the last few months, a persistent pandemic, a severe economic contraction, and ongoing protests against racial and class injustice in the United States and beyond, it's clear they all share a common thread. They all force us to confront the inequities that continue to persist in our global society. For example, here in the United States, communities of color, particularly African American and Latino communities, have been affected disproportionately by the coronavirus. Likewise, minority-owned businesses have been particularly affected by the suddenness and depth of the economic shock. And the protests in America's cities have revealed the pain, frustrations, and anger that have long been simmering throughout the Black community. I'm speaking here about the United States, but the trend is more general. Many of you who are joining us today from around the globe are witnessing similar inequities in your own societies and local communities. So the question we must ask ourselves is, what can we all do to remedy these inequities? There's no silver bullet to address these systemic challenges. However, there are some things that we as leaders in the financial services industry can do to help. And perhaps the most important is doing everything we can to embrace the strengths of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And in particular, encourage greater financial inclusion and shared prosperity for all. This isn't a new commitment for me. In fact, it's something I've been working on for more than two decades since I began my career working on community investment issues in the private sector with a heavy emphasis on financial inclusion and shared prosperity. Over the years and in various ways, that commitment has continued in my public service career. Today, I'm blessed and fortunate to lead the independent financial regulatory agency that oversees the United States system of federally insured credit unions. And financial inclusion is indeed a central part of my agenda here at the agency. But what's different is that people are becoming more aware of why these issues are important. And that new awareness is something we should welcome as a foundation upon which to build. Now, I'd like to pause here for a moment for emphasis. I'm not simply talking here about diversity and inclusion at the top. I'm talking about a broader based agenda that promotes opportunity for everyone. Let me explain that perhaps a little more clearly. If you follow the discussions in the media and among corporate leaders, they talk about the need for diversity all the time. And we all, frankly, welcome that discussion. It's timely, relevant, and necessary. 
But I'll confess that sometimes those discussions make me a little uneasy, and here's why. If we're just replacing a bunch of holders of Ivy League degrees on the board of directors with a different group of Ivy League degree holders, it's indeed hard to see how we've made an appreciable difference for society at large. And we've certainly done little to address in a substantive and concrete way, the inequities that are at the root of the stresses and the instability our societies all struggle with. I want to go beyond the idea of diversity and inclusion as simply a matter of representation and move toward thinking about diversity and inclusion more holistically as a matter of participation for a larger group of people, which is why I believe financial inclusion is so important because it's broad based because it makes a big difference in a lot of people's lives by helping to expand access to capital and break the cycle of dependence. And because it would go a long way toward easing these inequities that are so troubling to all of us here today. And I certainly believe credit unions are uniquely well positioned to address this need with your commitment to cooperative action and your community roots Credit unions are the ideal vehicle for expanding financial inclusion more widely and more holistically. With that in mind, I've been using my position as the 11th chairman of NCUA, but also as someone with a long career in the financial services industry to urge credit unions to take the lead of financial inclusion and to bring more people into the mainstream financial services arena. What I'd like to do now is give a brief overview of how credit unions can encourage and incentivize financial inclusion. And I'll say at the outset that this is not a comprehensive policy agenda, but rather a set of guiding principles we can use to think about financial inclusion with greater clarity. Financial inclusion, what can we do? Well, for the sake of time, I'd like to focus less on the question of internal diversity and inclusion within the industry because I trust many of you are already working diligently within your own organizations on internal diversity. Instead, I like to focus on the outside game of how we can deploy these values to reach and serve a wider swath and range of people. That's why I've argued we must consider diversity in a more expansive way beyond the standard categories. For example, we must ask ourselves, are we doing everything we can to reach people with lower moderate incomes? Are we including disabled and differently abled individuals in our financial inclusion plans? What about people in hard pressed urban communities or conversely distressed rural communities where financial services options are limited? We should be thinking hard about these kinds of questions because they're at the core of true meaningful financial inclusion. Second, we must use financial technology in ways that will result in greater financial inclusion. I recognize that all of your institutions are looking at how fintech can be used to improve efficiency or customer service, especially as the pandemic has driven increasing numbers of banking customers into a digital world. But let's not forget that fintech tools can also enable us to connect with minority communities, rural communities, and other underserved and marginalized populations. There are tremendous opportunities here, so let's continue the great work our credit union industry is doing on the FinTech front. For example, and I'm proud of this, I know that the World Council of Credit Unions, through its Technology and Innovation for Financial Inclusion Project, is working with financial institutions in West Africa to create a digital credit union. By exploring opportunities for partnership with technology and business development providers, the project's goal is to improve small and medium enterprise lending strategies in developing countries of the world. That indeed is a great example of how FinTech is making a real difference where it's needed most. Third, we need continued innovation in financial products that promote greater financial inclusion. Credit unions have shown great creativity in developing new types of products, and I urge you to keep up that good work. One area that seems like a particularly promising avenue for change is social impact investing. 
For example, not too long ago, we saw the launch of a new exchange traded index fund in the United States markets that focuses on investing in companies with a strong racial and ethnic diverse policy platform to encourage investment in companies that are leading the way on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Along similar lines, some financial institutions have launched faith-based investment vehicles that allow people to save and invest in accordance with the doctrinal principles of their religious traditions. Those are compelling and interesting approaches. We should also be looking at other types of social impact investing that could help underserved urban populations or encourage investment in distressed rural communities. And I'd like to see that same spirit of innovation put to work on behalf of microfinance projects, alternative lending products that will help us to put other unbanked, uh, underbanked populations on the road to prosperity. I'm talking a lot about microfinance and how you all can play a part in generating microfinance opportunities. And finally, we need to invest more fully in financial literacy education and training that helps people understand how to navigate an increasingly complex world of financial services. Just about two weeks ago here in the United States, the US Department of Treasury released the 2020 National Strategy for Financial Literacy, a document that details a number of ways to strengthen consumers' financial capability and well being. I'm proud to say that my agency, the National Credit Unit Administration serves in the Treasury's Financial Literacy and Education Commission and made a number of contributions to the strategy document. So I encourage you to go to our website to review the document. The strategy cites a government study that found that in the United States, for every dollar spent on financial education, about $25 is spent on financial marketing. Now I understand as well as anyone that marketing is important for any business enterprise, but you can imagine the effect we could have if we could balance that ratio in the other direction. Again, this is an area where credit unions have always led the way. The industry has a long and proud history of helping people of modest means develop the tools they need to engage knowledgeably with financial services but it's still an area where we should continue to invest to bring more people into the system of legitimate financial services that are affordable and accessible. Some of my discussion may appear to be more US specific in its immediate application, but these ideas might, in my opinion, serve as a useful way to spur innovative thinking for some of our participants in other countries around the globe, for our SACO credit unions in Africa, our corporativas in Latin America, or our building societies in the United Kingdom. We all know that good ideas are not constrained by national borders. So I'm happy to share my ideas with our larger global audience. And of course, we're always open to hearing your ideas for what we can do to improve our own local communities for financial inclusion, inclusion and economic opportunity to remain paramount and important. But it's not simply enough to simply diagnose the problem and then hope that somehow it gets better because hope is not a strategy. The key is that we need to take action now to make this happen sustainably. If we create conditions where people can gain access to credit and capital, break the cycle of debt and dependency, and achieve financial security and resilience for themselves and their families, we will have gone a long way toward addressing the inequities that are fueling so many of the social challenges we face today. It's why I believe so passionately and so strongly that financial inclusion is indeed the civil rights issue of our time and why I have made it a central focus of my chairmanship and as a regulator at the NCUA and while I'm so relentless in encouraging the financial services industry to take this up as your cause and as your mission. As I conclude, I'll conclude, ladies and gentlemen, with a quote from the great U.S. President Abraham Lincoln, who said in 1862 that, it is not can any of us imagine better, but can we all do better? The occasion is piled high with difficulty and we must rise with the occasion, as our case is new. So we must act and think anew. That was in a message to Congress at the height of the US Civil War. 
Ladies and gentlemen, I don't believe the challenges we face today, serious though they are, or as difficult as they faced then, but we should still be asking ourselves, how can we all do better? I deeply believe the answer to that question begins with a renewed commitment to these principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion in our business models. And with the renewed commitment to real financial inclusion to bring more people into the legitimate financial services system. With that commitment, we can indeed make a real stride toward, as President Lincoln suggested, thinking anew and acting anew. World Council of Credit Unions, let's rise to this occasion and think and act anew. Thank you all so very much for allowing me to join you today. Chairman Hood, thanks so much. That was as uh, inspiring as it was informative. I, I was sure to jot down the, the quote, financial inclusion is the civil rights issue of our time. And I know a lot of what you talked about today is gonna generate a lot of questions from our attendees who are joining us from all over the world. I do wanna mention we are gonna have some questions from the attendees here on the webinar. So if you're watching and you wanna ask questions of Chairman Hood, You'll see a Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. You can, you can list all of your questions there. Right now, I want to bring in our other two panelists, uh, Brian Branch. He is the president and CEO of World Council of Credit Unions. Brian, if you could turn on your camera and your microphone for us at this time. And also Jim Nussel, who is the president and CEO of Credit Union National Association here in the United States. Both of them, uh, I know, were listening keenly to that presentation and have some thoughts on it as well, because I know going forward, it's going to take a global effort to, I guess, reach the goals that you were talking about uh, in, in your speech. Brian, are you with us? Um, I'm sorry, Greg, Brian's uh, uh, headset cut out. Uh, okay. He's coming in a different method. Okay. Just one moment. Brian will be joining us here shortly. Um, I, I guess I'll turn to Jim Nussel. Jim, if you're there, Give us your immediate thoughts on, on what you heard. I know you know Chairman Hood, and, and I guess uh, well, it looks like we have Brian back here. Um, maybe we don't. Please, please give him a couple of moments. Sure. Thank you. Uh, Jim, I'll get your thoughts. Jim Nussel from CUNA, um, your thoughts on, on the comments from Chairman Hood. Yeah, I, well, of course, I've heard. Uh, our Jim, can you put your camera on for uh, us? Hello. Could you put your camera on for us? There you go. Yeah, I've heard, uh, first of all, good afternoon or, or uh, good day for those who are visiting at different time zones. And thank you for including me. And I've had the, uh, the chance to work with our, uh, our chairman a number of times and have heard him speak on this topic. And there's nobody who has a, a more passionate uh, vision and story behind this than, uh, than Chairman Hood. We really appreciate uh, his stewardship and, uh, and his help as we've, as we've navigated this as credit unions. And America's credit unions are, are behind this, this effort. There, in fact, there are many who will tell you that this is the reason why credit unions were born in 19... 34 and, and uh, even before is financial is financial inclusion is is part of our DNA. Uh, we were not included. It were they were mill workers in New Hampshire and, and across the country in many different instances that were not included in in financial services that band together in a cooperative uh, system to provide financial uh, assistance to provide loans and lending ability. Uh, to their brothers and sisters and neighbors and friends uh, and co-workers. And so financial inclusion has been part of our DNA. And I think you see that in so much of what has happened organically in the credit union movement throughout our history. I think what I'm asking for at this point, and I know Chairman Hood is and so many other credit union leaders, is that not allowing this to just happen because it happens organically, but actually lean into it. Uh, if it's true that financial inclusion is the civil rights, uh, the, the civil rights of, our, of our present and our future, then why? Why is that? Well, I think it's pretty obvious that you can say people are free, uh, you can provide them equal rights, you can provide them access, but if they don't have the ability to make a decision, 
which often comes with resources. If they don't have the ability to make ends meet, if they don't have the ability to do more than maybe just pay their bills, uh, then they're not going to have much freedom. They're not going to have much control over their future. They're not going to be able to send their kids to college or take a, you know, take a hobby out of their basement or out of their garage and turn it into a small business and employ their neighbors and friends and turn it into a, a an economic engine. Those are all things that only happen when you're included uh, in 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 finances in our community. Uh, the way that credit unions allow us to do that. And I think it's the reason why you see in America, certainly, where we have uh, so many uh, credit unions that are minority depository institutions. Now over 10% of credit unions are, are MDIs. Uh, there are, in fact, three times more credit unions uh, than banks uh, when it comes to minority depository institutions. Uh, there are, and, and that's about 5% of all credit unions for that matter. It's about 266, if I'm not mistaken, that, that, are, uh, uh, that are minority depository institutions. There are also about a uh, little over 300, about 324 uh, that are CDFI, Community Development Financial Institutions, that are again reaching out into communities of color and moderate and low income uh, communities to ensure that there is equal access, that there is inclusion in the financial opportunities. Now, I think it's a fair question to say, can we do more? And the answer is, you bet we can. And credit unions all the time are answering that questions by expanding into what many of us call financial deserts across the country, where our, there are no, no other access to financial uh, services at all, where banks have abandoned the territory and now credit unions are expanding into those areas. Now we've been hampered uh, by fields of membership and things like that, but the chairman and his administration and before, we've always tried to expand uh, fields of membership to provide even more people with access. So that's a long answer to, uh, if you're gonna have this as a right, uh, you've gotta have the freedom and the access and the inclusion to be able to exercise your rights and uh, that's what credit unions traditionally have been able to provide. And uh, I think that's how we can blaze a trail into the future. Question for both of you, and I'll start with Chairman Hood. You know, we're obviously trying, talking about trying to do this in the middle of a pandemic. And what has been the impact of the pandemic from your point of view on credit unions' ability and to commit to diversity, equity, and inclusion? Well, if I can begin with responding to that. First, again, thank you for allowing me to join you all today. The credit unions have stepped up to the plate in more ways than any of us could ever imagine. In the midst of the pandemic, credit unions are doing what they do best, and that is looking after the needs of their member owners. I, as a regulator, have been issuing a number of letters to credit unions um, that we at NCUA have been issuing to them, letting them know we want them to work with their member owners to help restructure loans or provide lower interest rates, wanting them to really reach out to their members when they need the most. What I want to say, though, to all of you who are listening all over the world is that the credit unions do not need me as the regulator to tell them to do the right thing. They are doing it on their own volition, whereas when I speak with some of my peers from the other banking entities, uh, the regulators, they are literally having to tell the bankers, you must really look for ways to help your, your customers when they need you the most. Well, I'm so blessed that our credit union system, because as Jim Nelson mentioned, credit unions grew out of adversity. They grew out of 1934 following the depression when the members of credit unions today, they could not get loans from that local bank. They were the mill workers, the plant workers, the factory workers. They galvanized and marshaled their resources to create the system of cooperative credit that's now a beacon, I think, throughout the world. So with that being said, credit unions have always honored that ethos and that mantra of people helping people. So what am I seeing amid the pandemic? I'm seeing that credit unions are continuing to serve their members. I'm seeing that they're continuing to make loans and restructure loans. I'm seeing that when we talk about minority depositories, we are seeing our minority depositories really being that first line responder when it comes to helping those minority businesses stay solvent and sustainable during the pandemic. I'm very pleased of how the MDIs that we regulate, we're all participating many in the PPP program. That is a US Treasury program that was designed to spur lending uh, paycheck protection program to help small businesses have capital so they could pay, make their payroll. 
there is an MDI that was able to do a lot of lending. In fact, there is one minority depository that was able to do 1,000 PPP loans for an aggregate size or a median size of about 13,000. So dollars. So that means that those small business owners were able to get capital. So what are we seeing? We're seeing credit unions helping their members. They're getting that advice from us at the NCUA. So we are encouraging them to do that. In addition, we're making sure they have the resources. So my regulatory philosophy is that regulation needs to be effective and not excessive. So while I want to ensure that we have guardrails, I want to ensure that we're keeping our institutions safe. I still want to reduce their regulatory burden so that they can focus their resources on serving those members now more than ever in the time of need. Jim, what are your thoughts? I would only add a few things. I, I, I think that credit unions have probably no different than anyone else back in, in March and April. You know, they, they received the same gut punch that everybody did from COVID-19 and whether that was the public health challenge or the uh, economic challenge, but uh, they are the financial first responders in America. And, and they're the ones that people turn to uh, when, uh, when there's a crisis, whether it's a hurricane or wildfires or COVID-19, one of the first things you do uh, during a, a crisis like that is you check on your money. You know, do I have what I need in order to get through whatever I'm trying to get through? And what they found, first of all, was credit unions were open. A lot of businesses were closed. A lot of entities, a lot of enterprises, they couldn't figure out a way to open or they weren't allowed to. Uh, our financial first responders at the credit unions, they were there and they weren't told how to deliver their services. No one, you know, no central body. I certainly didn't at CUNA, even though we represent 5,300 credit unions across the country, we didn't tell them how to do it. Each and every one of those 5,300, they figured out how to do it on their own, very creatively, very nimbly, uh, and very passionately in order to make sure that they were delivering those services to their, uh, to their members. And as the chairman said, they got involved in this, uh, in this program to help small businesses. And even though credit unions have not traditionally been commercial lenders. They leaned into commercial lending and small business lending. Why? Because so many small businesses don't have a relationship with any financial institution. You know, they truly were built out of their basement or built out of their garage and a lot of it's what we call mom and pop kind of businesses. They really do dip into their cash and they, they make it go. Well, they had to go out to a credit union and, and credit unions adapted and they met the need over 10, almost $10 billion in PPP emergency loans uh, to help almost, I think it was a little bit more than 100,000 jobs get saved during all of this. Pretty amazing when you think about it. So credit unions stepped into a void, stepped into communities, helped people out as the, as the financial first responders. And I'll tell you one other thing, because you, you asked it this way, I don't think any of them did that because of or in reaction to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Meaning I don't think anywhere in there did somebody say, oh, we have to do that because of. It was natural. And, and so we have this natural DNA to do it. I think as we look to the future, we have to lean in even more. We may even have to lean in in ways that are maybe unnatural, not uncomfortable, but unnatural maybe areas where we haven't thought about it in the past strategically. How can we do this? How can we pour a little bit more energy into it? So I think that definitely needs attention. But during, during COVID-19, I think it just happened naturally, the way it happens every time disaster strikes uh, America. Credit unions lean in. Thanks, Jim. World Council President and CEO Brian Branch is now with us again. Uh, Brian, I know that you uh, heard all of Chairman Hood's comments. We've been talking a little bit about how the pandemic has affected uh, DEI initiatives across the world. And I know you wanted to talk about that and also the impact of regulatory burden. So I'll let you, uh, I'll let you handle some of this discussion. Thanks, Greg. And, and thank you, Chairman Hood. And, and thank you, Jim, for joining us today. And uh, we very much appreciate your words and your call to action. Uh, about the, the innovation, the commitment that, that Cretans can provide in terms of financial inclusion and providing access to populations that are underserved. If I 
could uh, talk a little bit about the, the work we do at the World Council and then tie it back into what we see in the regulatory framework. Many of the financial standards today are set at the international level. And much of that framework is designed to address the needs and the risks of very large uh, commercial banks, act, internationally active banks in particular. And so those standards uh, word by word uh, are not necessarily appropriate for credit unions. And this is part of the work that the World Council does is to advocate on behalf of credit unions. Now, much of that is about reducing regulatory burdens and re regulatory constraints for credit unions before they reach the national regulator. But you made a very good point, which is when we talk about uh, FinTech innovation, it's not always about efficiency. It's a great tool that we can also use to, to go deeper in terms of financial inclusion. And so we very much apply the same types of uh, analysis when we look at uh, international constraints or international regulatory frameworks, because we also talk about the proportionality of, of applying international standards in national regulations and how important that is for financial inclusion, because sometimes the regulatory burden, the regulatory constraints can prevent uh, community-based institutions from serving that underserved population and introducing some of the innovations uh, to reach those who traditionally have not had access to the formal financial system. So could you talk a little bit about what you have seen in terms of uh, some of the international standards that come and how NCUA looks to those standards when considering their own, NCUA's own regulations. We've seen some tremendous applications of proportionality by the NCUA here in the US and focused on helping to support financial inclusion. Well, a lot of that, Brian, that's a really good question. I would say that we look at a lot of the principles-based approach to regulation in terms of what are the things that we're seeing on the horizon that can be deployed here uh, as we try to bring about financial inclusion. And one of the things we're seeing is a lot of work being done around payment systems, is how do you help low to moderate income communities exchange cash and things like that with communities so it's better that may not have accounts. So we're looking at how do we work with those, some of the FinTech providers around payments. In fact, there's a group in Silicon Valley that it brought, briefed me recently on some things that they're doing uh, around payment systems. And I'm proud to say that some of our credit unions already working uh, within this uh, company where they are already doing some testing. I would also say the things that we're seeing, in fact, I was very proud of the work that you all have catalyzed in West Africa with the digital uh, credit union that's there that's gonna be created. We're looking at that as a model because if there's anything that's come from the pandemic, it has catalyzed the need for us all to look at digital and electronic banking, especially uh, as Jim Nelson mentioned, yes, many of the credit unions remained open during the pandemic, but for some of those customers who were not able to leave their homes, they were able to use a lot of the technology, whether it be digital footprints, and they were using a lot of the, the technology. So I certainly applaud those credit unions who embraced and invested in technology early on. Uh, and I'm glad to see that a lot of our member owners are using it. But for those other credit unions who have not, we're hoping that they're not going to be playing too substantial of catch up. I'm hoping that they are now seeing this as an opportunity to build stronger systems. If I can, I would like, to know, like for you all to know that we at NCUA, I know I am looking at innovation in terms of creating a new office of innovation and access. So just as I'm encouraging credit unions to embrace FinTech, I think we here at NCRA must do so as well. So we are looking at the tools that we would need to even have more uh, work with some of the folks from across the globe around what are some of the things they're saying, Brian. So it means perhaps working with some of the folks in Singapore who have a very sophisticated and complex system when it comes to looking at FinTech. Similarly, I've had some dialogue with folks in Canada. As you know, the credit union movement is very strong there and through the Desjardins movement. And then also meeting with some folks uh, from the Financial Conduct Authority. So we at NCUA are having those types of conversations because we will probably be launching the Innovation Lab soon, I get to learn from some of the other regulators around some of the pitfalls, what are some of the things we can avoid. And at the end of the day, it is about reducing the regulatory burden that the credit unions would have when we move forward with an innovative agenda. And that means making sure that we're not gonna have any unintended consequences where I come up with a policy, but yet it's hard for the credit unions to really enforce or implement with, with it, without it being costly. So it's gonna to have to be principles-based. I wanna also hone in when I mentioned Office of Innovation and Access. 
I'm not looking to innovate just because it's the new buzzword that we're hearing throughout the globe. I'm looking to use FinTech innovation because it's going to bring greater access to underserved and marginalized communities. So again, while innovation is important because it drives efficiency, it does help us better serve our consumers or in our case, members, member owners. But if you're not using innovation to drive inclusion or access, then sometimes people need to question why they're doing it. And again, I'm being very strategic about it being innovation and access to keep it always tied and mindful uh, to all of our folks in our industry. Very much appreciate that. And, you know, the, your comments about digitization are critical and we're finding this all over the world. And what was striking to us in, when we did a survey of our membership this year around the world, for the last, five to seven years, their top number one challenge, top of mind has always been regulatory burden. This year they came back to us with top challenge, uh, top of the mind is uh, digitization, digital transformation. And as you pointed out, the, the COVID crisis has now demonstrated to credit unions that those that are continuing to be able to provide service and growing in this environment are those that offer those online and mobile channels. and also, it's a con no longer a consumer expectation for convenience. It's a consumer expectation for safety. And so this is a, this is a trend that we will see continuing and will, in some countries, drive more consolidation uh, and in, in many countries, drive a lot more initiative, uh, a lot more innovation on the part of credit unions uh, to reach populations that they have not been able to serve to date. So... Well, it's I wonder. I could, I could agree with you more. And if I could just add, I think that also as we look to bring in more individuals in the credit union system, I'm proud of the fact that today's American credit unions serve nearly one third of the U.S. population. So we now have about 122.4 million members of our credit union system. But as we look at the demographic shifts that are taking place with the, the new folks, when I mean the young people who are millennials and even younger generations, they have almost come to expect to be served with digital technology. So I also think that as credit unions look to grow into this platform, recognizing that they are now going to have the opportunity to serve a whole population who grew up with iPhones. So, so that is, we have this one population who have, they've never seen a fax machine or anything of that nature. They have been so electronic from their date of birth. So it means that they're going to come not to look at it as a convenience. It's going to almost be a consumer demand. So again, I think credit unions are making that investment. If I will, I would also say that when we talked about the earlier question about uh, the regulation and peace, I think another area that we must be mindful of, and I am particularly as a regulator, innovation, fintech, digital platforms, important, but we also must have an equal amount of importance on cybersecurity. So those of us who are making those investments must always look at ways to hearten our defense mechanisms. Are we practicing good cyber hygiene? Are we using strong VPNs? Are we having all the tools we have in place to not just protect the consumer data, but to also protect the hardware of our credit union systems themselves? So that's another area that I mentioned just for everyone to be mindful of practicing and having great cybersecurity platforms as well. It should be equally important as, as your uh, innovation outreach efforts. Thank you. Jim, I, I know that uh, CUNA established uh, DEI as one of the key uh, new cooperative principles for the U.S. credit union system. And uh, certainly want to congratulate CUNA for that. Could you talk a, a little bit more about uh, what the role that CUNA is playing and in terms of helping credit unions to create a more equitable and inclusive financial system? Yeah, thank you, Brian. And I think, you know, the interesting thing, and the chairman mentioned this as well, uh, we've been on this journey now for a number of years. This isn't something that uh, is brand new. Uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion was a conversation that uh, the credit unions have been having for quite some time in certainly various uh, ways and in various stages. But we decided uh, it was a journey that started three years ago when we said, uh, should we do something to the seven cooperative principles that are the bedrock, the foundational bedrock of our credit union movement? Uh, should we do something to acknowledge that one of the strengths 
uh, one of the bedrock principles and strengths of our cooperatives is the diversity of our movement, uh, the equitable inclusion uh, of, uh, of people to that movement. Uh, and uh, we decided it was. Uh, we passed a, a resolution, uh, the, who's, who the godfather of which was Maurice Smith, uh, who was our chairman uh, at the time, and uh, who put forward this, uh, we thought, brilliant idea of amending the cooperative principles. Uh, we have also put that forward uh, to the international body to uh, consider for inclusion in the, uh, in the, in the cooperative principles internationally. Certainly we know the United States is on a slightly different track and, and we understand that, uh, that particularly in the last uh, number of months and, and most ex especially since the murder of George Floyd uh, in Minneapolis, uh, there has been a heightened need uh, for understanding and conversation and action uh, when it comes to these issues uh, that are certainly based in part in the United States history uh, and our own legacy that we're still dealing with sadly, uh, but, but dealing with nonetheless. Diversity, equity, inclusion is part of that, uh, but is really deeper, I think, than even uh, the challenge that we've seen in the last number of months. Uh, it goes to not only fairness and, and freedom uh, and civil rights, but it also goes uh, to the business case uh, for our credit union. We're better when we have diversity. Uh, we're smarter uh, when we have uh, different voices at the table in our boardroom or, or in, this, in the leadership of our credit union. Uh, we're stronger at reaching out to communities of color when they peer in the window of a credit union and they see someone who might look like them or speak the same language as them or relate to them as a neighbor or friend. We're just better, we're stronger uh, when we're able to do that. And so it may seem um, inappropriate to call that a business case, but it really is uh, it really does strengthen the business enterprise of a credit union to have diversity, equity, and inclusion. So even before the, the, the sad uh, and outrageous uh, developments of, of the racial concerns of, of this summer, uh, credit unions have been on this journey for diversity, equity, and inclusion because it's the right thing to do and it makes us better uh, as a movement. And so that's the reason we do it. Again, it's a journey. Uh, and we all know uh, that that we you know we're gonna, we have a long way to go uh, in in this journey. But making the determination, we're going to lean into it, starting with our bedrock principles as maybe an eighth principle, or possibly inclusion as one of the other seven principles. We think is the right way to go, and so that's why we put the the stake in the ground and said this is what we believe in as America's credit unions. Thanks, Jim. Uh, just one more comment, and then I'll turn it over to Greg for Greg to pull in some questions from the audience. And as, as Jim pointed out, this, this is a real issue. This is a real challenge for us in the United States. But this is also a challenge in many, many countries around the world. And here we look at specific populations. We can go to another country. We can find other populations that are suffering this kind of inequity and injustice. But what is inspiring uh, about being part of the Great Union System is that across all of these countries, these different cultures, you very often see Great Unions at the front line, mm -hmm. serving these underserved, these uh, less privileged communities and finding ways to bring them in and give them access to a better life uh, through financial inclusion, just as Chairman Hood has described. So uh, thanks for that. And, and Greg, I know we have some questions from our audience. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people are out there are wondering kind of a similar thing, which is whether or not there are um, things that can translate borders. In other words, are there things you can do with DEI? And Brian, maybe you're best to address this first, but are there things that you can do with DEI that aren't limited to a certain jurisdiction, a certain nationality, or a certain region? Thanks, uh, Greg. Uh, Chairman Hood talked a lot about uh, funding applications of digital technology. In many countries, we've seen that it's the small amounts of 
volume of savings and loans, the lack of traditional collateral, the uh, high cost of many small transactions in an urban environment. And then we add the cost of distance, the dispersed populations in a rural environment. Uh, and we find that very often credit unions are able to undertake digital innovations today uh, to map out and to find ways to offer products and services that are corresponding to the particular circumstances. It might be reduced mobility, it might be uh, uh, local conflicting responsibilities and find ways to take the services to people where they live and, and where they work. And we have examples all over the world of Creighton's finding applications of digital technology to serve these populations. The challenge we often hear is it's very expensive for one small credit union to be able to do that. And that's why, again, the pattern across so many countries is uh, for credit unions to come together, cooperatives cooperating to build shared platforms that enable them to jointly invest in the technology, the human resource capacity to establish and to maintain that technology to provide the services uh, to these populations. So there are lots of great examples out there. And I would just add that credit unions are uniquely positioned to do just as Brian just articulated because of the people helping people ethos and also the cooperative spirit. Uh, where I said, I see a lot of cooperation with credit unions. I know here in the United States, we have the credit union service organizations or the CUSO model. That means that credit unions are collectively marshalling their resources to invest in things such as back office support, what we call shared branching, which means for those of you outside the US, it means that one credit union may allow members of another credit union to have free access to its branch network of credit union ATMs and things of that nature. So when we look at shared platforms, who better than credit unions to demonstrate this throughout the globe because of the cooperative spirit? Thanks to both of you. Uh, we have a question from Clinton Butler, who is with us today. He wants to know, how does financial well-being factor into inclusiveness? Well, well, I'd, to take that I'll first. be glad to start with that. I, in fact, that's what I was just about to add, that I think one of the other universalities that, that we have as a movement is that if, you know, it's, it's one thing to be open, it's another and, and to include but once we get a member inside the door, we all know that everybody's just a little bit different and they all need uh, a little bit different touch. Uh, they might need a, a different service. Uh, they might need different information or education at that moment. Uh, and I can tell you that coming into the uh, COVID-19 crisis and the economy that resulted, uh, Americans were about seven in, in 10 uh, living paycheck to paycheck. Uh, that has now grown uh, with unemployment, with the downturn in the economy, with loss of jobs, et cetera. And people coming out of COVID, whenever that happens, and it's probably going to happen in different stages and different ways for different people, uh, we're going to need to lean into uh, financial wellness. We already do. Credit unions have been part of what we've referred to in the old days as financial literacy. Uh, nowadays, people don't want to be called illiterate, they want, to, uh, uh, they want to be given information at the life stage they're in, uh, just in time to meet the decision that they're trying to make. Well, there's going to be, again, universality when it comes to uh, so many challenges coming out of COVID-19. Emergency savings uh, will, by that time, most likely dry up for many. Uh, the living paycheck to paycheck will most likely continue assuming that they have a paycheck. So many small businesses have closed. And so how do we create an economic engine of small business development into the future? All of these are gonna require a certain level of financial wellness uh, and financial literacy, financial education. The credit unions are able to do, and we've demonstrated that we do, and we all do something. Well, how can we all do it together? I think the verses need to be different, but the refrain needs to be the same. The chorus to this music needs to be the same. The credit unions are at the tip of the spear when it comes to educating uh, Americans and for that matter, the world, when it comes to financial wellness and how to manage and afford their lives uh, coming out of COVID-19. And there's gonna be a lot of work to be done in a very high touch sort of way that I think will marry very well with the high tech that will be available as well. 
and I'm seeing some of the credit unions. In fact, I visited pre-COVID a credit union uh, outside of Baltimore, Maryland, where it was a young lady who was a bus driver for the city of Baltimore. She had a young family. She had been pretty much using what we call payday lenders. These were loans that she was getting at very high usurious rates, three, 400%. Once she joined the credit union, she was able to have access to not just an affordable financial product, but she was also able to get financial coaching and financial counseling. She was able to go from a pernicious payday loan that didn't have a credit reporting mechanism to now working with the credit union that provided an alternative to payday lending, where she was able to now have a FICO score of over 700. So she now has mainstream credit, and she's also now on the path to home ownership. So that is what financial inclusion for me is. It's that well-being that she now can have access to affordable financial services. She's not left vulnerable to these payday lenders who don't have anything at all to care about her financial health and well-being. She is just like millions of other people that credit unions can help by partnering with groups to provide the financial coaching and counseling. In fact, this particular credit union, they have an individual whose sole job is to provide the coaching and counseling. And Jim is right. We used to talk about financial education. That was nice 10, 15 years ago, or even 10, 15 months ago. But it's so much bigger than teaching individuals about how to read their credit report and budget. And it's about teaching them and working with behavioral economists and other individuals to say, how do you break that cycle of debt and dependency? How do you get involved in the financial system? And now she knows what it's like to be a mainline participant and also her children know. So that cycle of dependency has already been broken and almost in one generation because of a credit union of, of creating an intervention. And those are other stories that I'm sure that it's not just the US that can deploy financial coaching and counselors. And again, that could also be another tool where FinTech can play in terms of being able to reach individuals through the use of their technology and providing that coaching and counseling. Got another question from Sue Mitchell who wants to know, is it possible to unify a DEI initiative that boldly demonstrates the credit union difference globally while increasing the visibility of credit unions within the US on social purpose? I think uh, that's part of what we're doing here. And, uh, uh, you know, Jim mentioned the, the murder of, uh, of George Floyd, and we had a tremendous outpouring of uh, concern, inquiries, empathy uh, from credit union systems all around the world. And uh, people very quickly were able to communicate. They related uh, to what they were seeing in the United States with what they were seeing in their own country. We saw initiatives on the part of national associations uh, stepping up and accelerating or, or uh, placing a greater priority on their DEI initiatives as well. And so I think the, the moment is, is just opportune for that kind of effort. And it really boils down the extent to which we tell our story and we share those stories with each other. We move for their questions from the audience at this time, but we only have a few minutes left, about five minutes left. And Brian, I wondered if you had any final thoughts that you wanted to share with folks on, on any of these subjects. You know, I think we've talked today a lot about um, coming together uh, on a DEI initiative, and we've identified that there are several aspects to that. It's a jigsaw puzzle, uh, and it includes really, we talked about financial inclusion, Thank you, Chairman Hood. We've talked about the importance of taking advantage of the opportunities of digitization and what we can do to uh, use that innovation, not just for driving greater efficiency, but for driving deepening of providing services to those that are underserved. Jim talked about uh, the importance of that, that principle and holding that principle up in, in front of the work that we do, having that filter through the layers of our institutions. And noting that this is not necessarily, it doesn't have to be a big jump for credit unions. This is something that credit unions do uh, as part of their DNA. They do it uh, naturally. And we saw that with COVID-19. We saw that the immediate reaction of credit unions was to hunker down and help their members get through that crisis. So we're going to, I believe we're going to see the same thing in terms of responding to the DEI challenges around the world. Chairman Hood, I'll get your thoughts on that as well. Yes, I just want you all to know that as chairman of NCUA, I certainly want to make sure that I am providing the regulatory framework 
where all of our credit unions can have the tools they need to serve their member owners. I want to make sure that they know that we want them to succeed. We want our small credit unions. We want our minority depositories, our community development credit unions, our low income designated credit unions. They all are pay, playing a key role in making financial services available now when their member owners need them more than ever. Pre-COVID-19, 40% of American households could not come up with $400 if they had an emergency. If you were to overlay that with communities of color needing a $400 emergency uh, loan, that figure would go to 60%. If you were to further overlay that with disabled communities of color needing $400, the figure was almost 90% of American households, all from a Federal Reserve study. Those numbers were startling pre-COVID, and I can only begin to imagine what they would be post-COVID. So again, my framework will be to keep our institutions nimble, to give them the tools they need to succeed, to help them have any of the resources they need from us so that they can be there on the other side with the pandemic so we can get lending opportunities made, that we can help people save for their future, to get them the loans they need to get cars, to get sustainable home ownership through housing. So these are all the things that I really want to do uh, and to give the framework. And again, we want DEI to remain top of mind. I know we at the agency are practicing diversity, equity, and inclusion with our strategic planning, with our uh, employees here. We're looking at how do we make sure that we're not just hiring folks from diverse backgrounds, but are we giving them an environment where they feel included once they get here? So I've created a cultural inclusion council again those are the things that just as we advocate for you all doing, do know that we at the agency are doing some of those as well. And I look forward to working with you all in partnership. I look forward to us not being in this virtual environment and to my seeing a lot of you all in our credit unions throughout the globe. One of the highlights I was planning earlier this year was to be with you all in person to, to really see because I enjoy interfacing with my colleagues from Spain and London and Germany and Africa and, and Asia. And I regret that we're not able as regulators to do that this year, but I do hope that we can all get together next year where we share our best practices about what we've done to strengthen diversity, equity, and inclusion within the cooperative system of credit. All right, Jim, I'll let you uh, have the final word. Well, I can only add to what, uh, what Chairman Hood and, and Brian have mentioned that in, in addition to families obviously uh, being wiped out of much of their emergency savings, uh, we saw that, uh, interestingly enough, and I'll give you this backwards because it, it I think, packs a punch as a result. Uh, by the end of May, according to the Federal Reserve, uh, almost 20% of white-owned small businesses uh, had been shuttered, had been wiped out, or had been closed uh, just by the end of May as a result of, of what happened in the economy. For Latino-owned, it was 32%, so twice as much uh, for Latino owned as it was for white owned. But for African Americans, it was 40%. 40% of black owned small businesses were shuttered by the end of uh, April and May as a result of the pandemic. So the need is great. We're, we're not, we are not coming out of this uh, yet stronger uh, than how we came into it. We've got a lot of work to do and credit unions have always been the first financial responders there in our communities to deal with this. We're learning, we're leaning into commercial lending, but that is an engine that I think we need to expand in addition uh, to being there, people helping people as we always have uh, for the last 80 plus years. I think we've got the DNA to do it, but I also think we've got the strategic advantage to do this uh, in the future. And that's why I am so bullish about how credit unions uh, are positioned to help people going forward. And I, I'm sure this is true, not only across the United States, but I'm sure it's across the world as well. Well, thank you so much. It uh, was uh, very uh, welcoming to get all three of you gentlemen together. And Chairman Hood, we can't thank you enough for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us, Jim Nussel as well. And Brian, if you want to let people know that this was a webinar worth watching, it will be on our YouTube channel available later today or tomorrow. That's uh, youtube.com slash woku, W-O-C-C-U, youtube.com slash woku. Thanks so much, everybody. We hope you have a great day.